Hear the Lord's promises spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons will come from afar and your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and be radiant and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree and the cypress together to beautify the place of my sanctuary and I shall make the place of my feet glorious. Violence will not be heard again in your land, nor destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and the days of your mourning will be over. Then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. The smallest one will become a clan, and the least one a mighty nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's sing those very words, arise, your light has come. Wherever you are, let's stand together and sing. Show for the 
Thank you so much for gathering with us in worship today. Would you just take a moment just to acknowledge those around the room. We are so grateful to have you with us today. If you're worshiping with us at home, God bless you. Welcome to worship. We're so glad you're here. Welcome to First Baptist Church of San Antonio. We're grateful that you're here on this Sunday, number 39. And we worship still, even though we are 269 days into this business. Hopefully it'll be over sooner than later. And this week has been a difficult one. And not because I have had my first COVID test, which I passed with flying colors. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. But we mourn because this schedule has been so bare. You know, usually this time of year in our church, we are crescendoing towards Christmas with festivities the whole month of December. And tonight would have been our children's Christmas pageant. But unfortunately, because of COVID, we've had to call an audible. Now, we still celebrate, and we celebrate the goodness of the Lord together, and, and we celebrate with just a little bit more space between us than before. And so we're going to do our best to come together in honor of our Lord recognizing the joy and the gift of Christmas, even in 2020. And as we do, I want to give you a couple of ways that we're doing that together, in ways that we celebrate together as the First Baptist Church of San Antonio. And the first one of those ways, that I want us to recognize our media team and Jeremy Harper for the great job that they've done. So let's, let's thank them. <laughs> Now, and I want to I thank them for something in particular, because our, our media team has worked diligently the last few weeks with our choir, our orchestra, our Lagos worship band to put together something special for Christmas at first. You know, generally, this week would be pretty hectic uh, for Pastor Aaron, because we'd be running through a marathon, literally, and this is the week of the marathon we would traditionally be working around, and we'd be looking forward to Christmas at first happening next weekend. But this year, we've had to do it uh, in a different way. And so they have been recording pieces for weeks now and putting together something special and unique for 2020. And so we want to make sure that you don't miss this. Now, every year, KSAT 12 broadcasts our Christmas program uh, on Christmas Day. And they're going to do the same thing again this year. However, you won't have seen it before. In fact, you'll, we'll be watching it live with, with all of us as we sit down and celebrate Christmas Day together. So 11 a.m., KSAT 12, Christmas Day, you'll get to see our Christmas at first. Uh, and it's going to be beautiful and holy. And so we hope you'll worship with us on Christmas Day in that way. Now, also, traditionally, we have a moving Christmas Eve service. And this year we have to do that different as well. And we're still going to do something for Christmas Eve because that's special to us, that's important to us. But we've yet to be able to discern what that's going to look like. Now we need your help. On Wednesday morning, you should have received a survey from the church. If you're a church member, you should have had it in your email Wednesday morning. And it was a Christmas Eve uh, survey about what you prefer and what you hope for and what you expect it to look like. And if you haven't yet filled that out, um, we would love to hear your voice, and we would love for your voice to shape what Christmas Eve looks like in 2020. So if, if you haven't yet done it, please take the time to do that so we can make the final call on what a safe and good 2020 Christmas Eve looks like. Now, with those things said, l let us pray, and we're going to continue on with Advent 2, listening for the voice of our Lord. So let's pray together.
Lord, it is a joy to worship. And it's a joy that we can still worship together. Even with distancing in the room or through the TV or online, Lord, you have allowed worship to continue. We cry out, Jesus is Lord. We anticipate the movement of the Spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would come and show us your ways. And Lord, we pray that this time would be unique and special and holy. And Lord, our worship would be filled with your Spirit so that we would recognize that this was a moment with the Lord where we experienced the Christ and knew the Spirit. And so, Lord, would you come? and break into our hearts and, and cause our ears to listen, our minds to understand that we might hear your voice. Lord, would you speak so that we might know you and follow you wherever you lead. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And normally we would move to the children's time. And the children would come and, and help me light the candle today. And since we don't have a whole throng of children, I'm inviting my oldest daughter, Avery, up. Come on up, Avery. She's going to come help us light the candle this morning. And on, on this, the, the second Sunday of Advent, I'm going to light that right there and light this one. We're listening. Uh oh. Here, we'll light it from this one. There you go. And hold on just a second. On this, the second Sunday of Advent, we're listening for the Lord. You know, we recognize that so often for us, we spend all of our time speaking, and we cry out to the Lord, and we tell him what's on our heart. We tell him what's on our mind. We tell him what we need. We tell him what we want. And on this Sunday, we're, we're reminded that in this relationship and in our times of prayer, we listen, and we need to take the time to be silent and to hear the voice of the Lord. So Avery, go ahead and light that second candle. Like that. Mm -hmm. And so we light this candle and we listen together. We try to set aside all the things that distract us and listen for the voice of the Lord. And go ahead, blow it up. Here, I'll get it. <laughs> I got it. As I was planning worship for this week, I came across this poem, and our, our reverse text this week is not only good for our study of Mark, but it's also appropriate for our, um, our ad observance of Advent. And so I wanted to share this poem with you, so as, as you listen and hear, just, just continue to prepare your hearts. It's called Welcome the Wild One. Welcome the wild one, the desert disclaimer, urgently, awesomely crying his news. Now listen, now, there is one who comes after. I am unfitted to fasten his shoes. Camel hair coated, unkempt and unbending, living off grasshoppers, honey and briars. Knee deep in water, he hails the impending flame giving spirits enveloping fires. Hear from the herald, the king who's expected. World-ending wrath is the power he describes. God's own anointed, outspoken, uncensored, judging the palace, the priest, and the scribes. See now the young one who lingers and listens, standing intent in the buzz of the throng, waiting in line on the brink of decisions seeking the spirit that beckons through John. Gaspingly drenched by the people's baptizer, drowned in the grief of our groanings and cries, bowing beneath God's unfettered outsider, rising envisioned, he opens his eyes. Welcome, God's child, anointed, invested, desert impelled by the spirit within. World-making love, shining, tempered, and tested, now is at hand. Let salvation begin.
So I hope you've been reading your Bible this week. I hope that you've been reading Reverse with us this week. And if you've been a friend of First Baptist for very long, for particularly the last two and a half years, one of the messages that we continue to hear is that of repentance and our need to repent. Not just the first time you come to know Jesus, but every day. To, to desire to be clean and pure. And boy, if you read the words of John the Baptizer, you hear that, don't you? And later next week, we're going to hear Jesus' first words of his ministry, repent. We need to be a people marked by repentance. So here now, as I read from 1 John 1, 8 through 2, 2, this message. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make a liar, and uh, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Thanks be to God. So let's, let's sing of that, that very thought that we'd ask God to search our hearts. And, and friends, let's covenant to do business with God today, each one of us. Wherever you may be, let's stand together and sing this hymn.
remain standing as we prepare to read together God's word. Amen. We began a new study today in our reversed texts. We are in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and we're going to read that aloud together. You can follow along. It's in your bulletin there. So, this then is the text for today. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May God bless the reading of his word. So if you go online and you search basic human needs, you'll get a very common result. In fact, the common result that you'll see if you Google that is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's, it's like this pyramid. And the most necessary of needs, if we can say that, the most necessary of needs are at the bottom of that pyramid, and it goes up. And so on the bottom, you'll find on Maslow's hierarchy that you'll find food and water, and then you'll find shelter, warmth, or some kind of protection from the elements. Right, so you've got food, water, and then protection from the elements, and then sleep. Is, is also on this. It's kind of the bottom four that those are kind of the, the, the foundation of the hierarchy of needs. And then you see it kind of goes up and you see things like safety and friends and you need those kinds of things and you need to have accomplishments in your life. So those are kind of up towards the top. But as you work down, what we're talking about today are these, these things on the bottom, basic human needs. Now let's talk about the math there and the math on these four things that Maslow has at the bottom of his needs, food, water, the protection from the elements, and sleep. So with food, you can generally go three to four weeks without food. We, we, can, we can make it. We can survive almost a month without having something to eat. Water is different. We know, right? Water, you can probably only go three or four days without water, and then you will pass away. And that's what we're talking about here, right? When we're talking about these kinds of needs, it's the kinds of things that if you don't have, you will die. So food, die three or four weeks. Water, you'll die three or four days. Now, it's, it's harder, though, with the protection from the elements, like the, the clothes or the shelter, and it, it matters if it's really hot or it's really cold or how long you've been exposed and, and what you've got going on around you. But if, if you're just thinking in the most extreme terms and, and extreme hypothermia, you, you, could, you could die in an hour or so left in, in extreme cold. And I think it's a little bit different, too, when you're talking about sleep. That's kind of on the, the last one on the list there. And, and sleep, if you go two or three days without sleep, your, your body starts to fight back. And in the end, the way they describe it, you'll, you'll do something that might eventually lead to your death after a couple of days of not sleeping. And so without these kinds of things, we see that you'll die quickly. Now, there's a problem here, and the first problem is very few searches on human needs, including Maslow's, there's very few, if any, include oxygen. And without oxygen, you'll die with 15, 20 minutes, depending on your lung, lung capacity. Now, I did find one list that included oxygen as the number one need of humanity, and then there were a couple others when you're looking at sites that talk about human survival and human needs. They say, well, yeah, you need oxygen. I mean, that, that's a given, but 
There's so little that you can do about oxygen, we don't even include it in our needs list. And in fact, if, if you don't have oxygen, you're just out of luck anyway. And so you might as well just kind of give up if you don't have oxygen. And see, much, much of the basic needs lists, and even Maslow's, just left oxygen off. And so it's only fitting then that not a single one of them listed the number one need of humanity for survival that Scripture does. In fact, Scripture said there's, there's, a, there's one primary need that you have for survival, and not a single one of them mentioned it. In fact, if you want to take a, think of it this way, maybe we've got the, kind of the pyramid, like Maslow's pyramid of those needs up there, and then maybe put a little pedestal on the bottom, make it look like a Christmas tree, because there's one little thing on the bottom that Scripture talks about that's more important than all those other things. And if you don't have that little Christmas tree trunk on the bottom of that hierarchy of needs, you're already a goner. See, as Scripture goes, you see, we have this one necessity for human survival. And I'm worried that, that many in the church don't, don't even know what this one necessity for human survival is. Now, I'm sure that all of us here in the room or all of us listening on TV, we could come up with a Sunday school answer. We could say the number one need for human survival is Jesus, right? And so we throw that out there. And, and if we did, you'd be correct on some level, but we'd have no idea why we were only generally in the right direction. You see, think of it like this. If we said Jesus Christ, we would be vaguely, technically correct. But if you're being graded by a math teacher, the math teacher wouldn't count it right because you didn't show your work. And so let's do that this morning. Let's start at the beginning and let's show our work on why the answer is Jesus Christ and what that means. Because when we're considering the, the necessity of humanity, remember, we're talking about death. And the, the things that, that bring death or the things that prevent death. And so we're, we're talking about these kind of common causes of human death that come most immediately. And then we kind of rank them in order of importance. And so a necessity is that which gives life. And so in the same way, that which gives life separates death and actually pushes death away from you. And so our necessity, and the necessity that we're talking about is the one that promotes life. And when people talk about food and water being necessities, this is what they mean. And th what they mean is, if those kinds of things aren't taken care of, if food and water aren't taken care of, you need to stop everything that you're doing, and your sole pursuit should be food and water. If you've gone two days without water, your sole pursuit this morning should be water, is what they would say that you need to pursue those kinds of things first. But Scripture has a different ranking. Scripture has a different order. In fact, Scripture says there's something far more important than water or food or shelter or sleep. And as Scripture lays out anyway, if, if you believe in who God is, if you believe the Word of God, if you believe God as our Creator, if He's the one that created all of this and brought it into being, if he, He's the loving God that came down to this earth incarnate, if, if that is true, and if we believe that and we live that, food and water are not your primary pursuit. Because if you believe in a God who created all of these things, and you believe in a God who's a heavenly Father who knows you need all these things, He will provide them in the moment that you need them. And all you have to do is go to Him first, and He will provide those things. Just like He did for Abraham, journeying to a new land. Or just like God provided for baby Moses, floating in a river. Or, or just like God provided for the 5,000 faithful ones listening to Jesus preach in the wilderness on the Galilean seashore. You see, though Jesus ate many meals with people, and though Jesus fed thousands upon thousands, and though Jesus even punctuated the passion with a final supper, it was never about the food. Food wasn't the necessity, and neither were the healings for that matter. There was always something deeper for survival. There was always a holy necessity that could only come from God, like fresh, clean air rushing down out of heaven. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 6. We'll turn there with me. This is after feeding of the 5,000. 
Jesus sort of reflecting back on what's happening. So this is John chapter 6, verse 26 and 27. Truly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Here Jesus' moment of, of judgment here over that group saying, you've only come to me because you want another bite of bread. And that's not what I'm about. I'm not here to give you another loaf of bread. I'm here to bring you something much deeper. So he says, uh, but because you ate of the loaves and you were filled, your bellies were filled up, so you came back. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him the Father, of, uh, Father God, has set his seal. Now skip over to verse 48. So same chapter, John 6, verse 48. Jesus continuing here. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. So here's it. It doesn't matter how much food you eat. You can eat all the bread in the world. You're, you're still going to die in this world. They ate in the wilderness. They died. This, though, is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I'm the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Bread is not the necessity that we make it out to be. Food is not as important as our stomachs tells us it is. There's something more akin to oxygen in the spiritual world. There's little we can do about it, but it makes all of the difference in the world. See, all, all of the physical things that we need are provided by God. But, but there's something that gets in the way. It's that three-letter word, sin, gets in the way, and sin blocks our relationship with God. Sin blocks our prayers from reaching into the heaven. Sin separates us from God. When we sin, we are torn apart from our God forever. And not only that, in, in our sin and what we see then and what you see unfolding in the pages of Scripture is that sin is the root cause of decay and death. Death happens in all kinds of forms these days, but the root of it all goes back to the sin of humanity that brings death upon all of us. And so with both of those things being true, with sin getting in the way of our relationship with God and separating us from Him, and sin being that which brings death and decay into the world, the single necessity of life is to solve the problem of sin. If you solve the problem of sin, you will live and live forever. It is sin alone that is separating you and walking you towards death. What you need most is the forgiveness of your sins. Can we talk about that, that little bottom piece on the Christmas tree? The one necessity that you need for life eternal? There's no fountain of youth out there. What you need is the forgiveness of your sins. And as Scripture teaches, if you're, if you're forgiven of your sins, you're, you're set free. And you're brought back into a relationship with God that, that allows you to live life unhindered. You see, we... We forget and, and we neglect and we, we don't always realize that, that what sin does is sin takes our life and it turns it into a series of tightening knots that chokes the life right out of us. We, we don't understand that it's sin that's holding us back in life. It's sin that's ruining us. It's, it's sin that's causing every bit of rot that we see. For every sleepless night that we have, we can blame the twisted grip of sin on this world. What Jesus came to tell us and what God has been teaching since time began is that when sin is untangled from your life, you're free. And you're free to live life as it was intended to be lived. See, the Word of God says it perfectly in Romans. Look, look with me uh, back over at Romans chapter 5. So Romans 5, first Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin. So it's taking that note. So death and all death is, is rooted back to sin itself. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now skip over with me to chapter 6. So Romans chapter 6, go to the next chapter in the last couple of verses of Romans 6, 22 and 23. 
But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, in, in our current condition, the necessity for life is the forgiveness of sin. Because Scripture is reminding us over and over again, it is sin that is producing death. And, and what you see is death all around us. And in fact, the, the, more of us are more like bones wasting away in a desert rather than living in some fruitful life. And God is saying there is a way out where you're no longer wasting away a skin and bone in a desert, but you can have life and have it abundantly. And that in the person of Jesus Christ, he came and we celebrate Christmas because he came to walk to the cross. And when he walked to the cross and he was crucified and he went to the tomb and then he came up out of that tomb and he was raised to new life and death died at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you no longer have to submit to sin. You no longer have to submit to death. We have life in the Lord. See, to say it another way, the biggest dilemma that you face today is your own sin. A single sin, a no to God, and you are dead faster than you would be from oxygen deprivation. Now, with that truth set in front of us, and so many at death's door, God came in all of his compassion, and God knew that you would need a savior and so God sent Jesus Christ to be born at the right time so that you might die at the right time so that you might have your sins forgiven. It is necessary, absolutely necessary for your sins to be forgiven, for you to live. And it's important for us this morning to think about it this way because anytime we think about forgiveness of sins, our mind begins to play tricks on us. And when we talk about forgiveness, it's real easy. And what our flesh likes to do is to start, start to think about all those other people who need forgiveness. We, we imagine to ourselves, who needs forgiveness the most? Who have I seen do the worst? Or we start to think, who has wronged me the most? Deeply needing forgiveness. But don't be distracted. Don't be distracted by them and what they need. That's not the message this morning. Let's set their survival aside for a moment. And, and in fact, let's focus in on your survival and what you need to survive this morning. And, and what you need is the forgiveness of God in your life. And you need it just as much as they do, if not more so. And so for survival, and for revival, and for life again, we need to be on our knees saying, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I, I confess that I am broken. I confess that I am weak that I've made terrible decisions and said no more often than I've wanted to. Lord, forgive me. And the truth and hope of Scripture is that in that way, you are forgiven. And so this morning, th this, is, this is between you and God. Th this, is, this is your sin and his forgiveness. This, this is his death for your life. This is the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that your sins might be forgiven, so that you might finally live. There are too many of us still tormented by death. You no longer have to be tormented by death. Come to the Lord and find life. Find his forgiveness and be set free from the conflict of your flesh and the conflict of your sin. God is offering you new life this morning. Let's not waste another day. Let's pray together.
Lord, we know. We know we're broken. We know that we have fallen short. We know, we know, we know. Sometimes we tried to pick ourselves up again and we've just fallen flat back on our faces. We know, Father. Lord, we know what death feels like. Lord, we have seen decay and we have seen this world rot from the inside out. And Lord, we need your grace. Lord, would you forgive our sins? And Lord, we, we beg you this morning to send your spirit upon this church and to send your spirit upon this city, Lord, to send your spirit upon your people that we might open our hearts up to you and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, and let not a single one of us be distracted. Let our sole pursuit be your son so that we might be forgiven of our sins. Lord, we need you. We pray that you would come, and we pray that you would come quickly. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We're going to have a time of response now. And so we ask all of us in here and all of us watching on TV to respond to God in some way this morning. Now, there's some ways you can respond uh, on the bottom of your listening sheet in your bulletin. Maybe you want to respond in, in one of those ways. Um, also, the altar is open. Uh, you, can, you can come kneel here. Brian and I will, will pray over you safely, uh, as it were. Maybe you just need to sit, sit where you are and reflect on what God is, is teaching you this morning, what he's showing you. But let me remind you, don't miss a moment to confess. You know, like we read earlier in 1 John, there's not a single one of us in this room that doesn't need to confess our sins before the Lord. Myself included. And so let's take the time to be a repentant people so that we might know life in Jesus Christ. So let's respond obediently unto the Lord.
Amen. Let me make a, a couple of notes uh, for life together this week. And as we said, Christmas isn't quite as full as we traditionally have, but let me note a couple of things that you need to be aware of. And one of those, if you haven't got your Advent devotional guide, those are available. And uh, we we're already about a week into that. They've been fantastic. I think Jack Pigeon was today in his devotional. So we're so grateful for all of our church members who've contributed to that. And uh, the music has been wonderful, too, to have a, a music this week um, or in this Advent book has been fantastic touch to that. So we hope you'll to do that along with us. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, please make note, Christmas Day, 11 a.m. KSAT. We'll have our uh, Christmas at first. And so uh, please take note of that. And then a uh, reminder to do the survey so we can best prepare for Christmas Eve and what Christmas Eve is going to look like here. We want to do it well. We want to do it safely. And so we, we need to hear your voice. So please take the time to do that. Now, lastly, from me, you see these beautiful flowers that are in front of me this morning. They're given to the glory of God. Uh, by Joe and Sandy Etheridge in celebration of their 70th wedding anniversary. So Joe, Sandy, we love you. Um, praise the Lord for them. Uh, give, give Joe and Sandy a, a call if, if you get a chance this week. We, we love them and grateful for their wor work here. And also I want to make note that today's television broadcast on KSET is given in honor of um, David and, and Jane Knowlton, and so we're grateful for the Knowlton family and the Etheridge family and how much they mean to this church, and how God has blessed us through both of these families. Amen. And just a brief reminder, if you're not aware um, and, and you're on Facebook and follow the church every day, every week, weekday at noon from 12 to 1230, we've got a, a different concert coming from Unity Hall. It's virtual only, so you can only access it through uh, through the online uh, service. But boy, I hope you'll make your make those uh, a priority. They're, they're such a good respite. And it's just great to hear live music um, in, in this season. So uh, Monday through Friday tomorrow is Mark Cruz, um, guitar professor at uh, Texas State, so I know that he, he will bless you, and so, so join us if you would, and Brian is on tap, so, so make sure that you're always tuning in, because <laughs> Brian's going to be one of our featured guests. I'm serious. You knew that, right? Okay. Um, so as we're dismissed today, we're going to stand together and sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, and we'll sing this, and then we'll be seated for the postlude. seated.
Thank you for being with us this morning. We're going to dismiss you. There should be a laminated colored piece of paper on your row, so we'll dismiss by those colors. So if you're sitting on a green row this morning, you're dismissed at this time.